everyone. Uh, my name is Anand Tripathi and uh, I will be taking a lot of your uh, history sessions here at Edukemi. Uh, now I'm sure you guys would be probably aware uh, that recently, very recently, uh, this gentleman, right, uh, Dilip Kumar, he passed away. One of the gems of Indian cinema. So considering that event, I believe that uh, we need to be slightly prepared with the, a small snapshot of Indian cinema. We will try and uh, trace how did it all begin and where do we stand. One point which I would like to maintain here is, of course, this is, a, you know, this could be an important topic for prelims, no, no denying that. But I would also suggest uh, that keep it as a topic which can, which can also be relevant for your essays and for your mains uh, examination as well, right? Uh, because the way cinema interacts with the society, that is something, uh, I mean, the cinema is a very powerful medium. I'm sure we do not need to argue that. Right? So how, what kind of an interconnectedness exists between the society and uh, cinema? Cinema, both as an artistic medium and uh, uh, as something which is really, really big time. It is the dominant artistic medium these days. Right? So keeping these uh, few pointers in head, let's try and uh, uh, you know undergo this journey, okay? Uh, beautiful man, I'm sure you would agree, right? I'm sure you would have seen certain movies of this guy as well. Uh, so uh, one very interesting fact which I was able to figure out was that there's no one person or one technology or one specific event which we can say that this was the breakthrough and this is the guy who, who started it all. It seems to be more a result of a, a continuous process. Certain improvements in technology when people started trying to deliver motion photography. Right? And do you see from, uh, you know, this, this is really interesting, motion photography. So the earliest attempts that we, that scholars tend to sort of agree upon is a technology which is called as a kinetoscope. It was like a bioscope, but it showed moving pictures. And it was possible for one person only to view it at a time. This was a kinetoscope, right? Uh, you know, in somewhere around 1890s, Edison, Edison, the same, uh, you know, uh, Thomas Alva Edison, his company, they were, uh, you know, experimenting with this kind of technology. Right? Uh, another big step, another big step when it comes to capturing moving images was uh, done, undertaken by, you know, a couple of brothers known as Lumiere brothers. Uh, these two gentlemen, in around 1895, they commercially, right, they commercially showcased 10 of their short films in Paris. So Lumiere brothers, they came up with the first cinematograph, that's what it is called as, that camera kind of a device which can record moving images okay uh, this is the you know kind of uh, equipment which these guys were using right and uh, this is how they were projecting it on the uh, screens very humble beginnings as you can see another fact which you should keep in mind was from 1895, this kind of a technology came in and the next year, the very next year, it was present in Bombay. This is how originally the seven islands of Bombay were. I hope you can, uh, you know, just have a look at them. Very interesting. This is how they were when Britishers 
right? Britishers in somewhere around 1780s, they reclaimed the land from sea. Bombay reclamation project and they joined these islands and that became the Mumbai as we know it of today. This entire architectural marvel of a project was headed by a person who is called as Hornby Wellard. I have this uh, knack of giving you certain details as well alongside any topic. Right? Uh, so this Henry uh, Hornby Volat, he was the person who was responsible for uh, joining these uh, islands. Moving on, coming back to cinema. So in 1896 itself, Lumiere brothers were showcasing their movies here in Mumbai. Right? Uh, Hiralal Sen, Hiralal Sen is considered the first Indian behind the camera. He started shooting certain uh, ads. He also shot, uh, you know, uh, Karzan Darbar. But he seems to be a very reckless man. Not much information is available, uh, you know, about this guy. And most of his work was destroyed in a fire, we are being informed. But he definitely was a pioneer. Right? Then the next person is H.S. Bhatavadekar. H.S. Bhatavadekar. Uh, inka claim to fame kya hai? What is his claim to fame? Uh, I will also show you the images. This is of course Hiralal Sen. I'm sorry I was not able to get better photographs here. The pixels are broken. Uh, but you know, uh, I think uh, images are important. I'm sure you would agree. Right? We all at Edukemi believe that we should be. You know, it is all about multimodal learning. Isn't it? Okay, so this is H.S. Bhatavadekar. He is credited with the shooting the first documentary of India called as The Wrestlers where he shot a wrestling match which was happening uh, you know in Mumbai, Hanging Gardens. H.S. Bhatavadekar. Uh, another very interesting uh, person associated with the early history of Indian cinema is Jamshed Ji from Ji Madan. He was the first serious, uh, you know, industrialist who started pouring in money, and developed a production house, and developed a distribution house. By 1930s, this guy was owning more than 120 theaters. So, the Majlo Purane Ponti Chadda kind of a person, right? Uh, pretty huge. One of the first person who owned theatres, one of the first Indians. Remember, we are talking about Indian cinema. Uh, he, you know, he established this Elphinstone Bioscope Company and started producing silent movies. Silent movies are basically those movies where there is no dialogue as such. Right? Because we were not yet able to capture the audio. So initially all the movies were uh, silent movies. The talkies, they emerged in 1926 onwards. Right? Initially they began in America and by 1930s they came to India. We will talk about that as well. Uh, The first, this is, this, is, this is interesting, right? And this is where UPSC can actually try and confuse you. Uh, the first Indian film, who is the first, uh, which is the first Indian film which was released in India? Couple of, uh, you know, uh, 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 viewpoints uh, exist here. The first one believes that it is uh, Shri Pundalik. Shri Pundalik. This was a silent movie in Marathi. What do I mean by a silent movie in Marathi? That means the credit, etc. They all were written in Marathi. Right? And it was made by Dada Sahib Torne in 1912. But there was a problem. Right? This is where the difference of opinion exists. 
This entire was shot by a British cameraman. It was basically a shot of Marathi play. And then the film was sent to Germany for processing. So a lot of scholars say this was not a truly Indian film. And this is why, this is why, instead of Dada Sahib Torne, the bigger name that we, me and you are aware of is Dada Sahib Palke, also known as uh, Dundiraj Govind Palke. He's considered as the pioneer of Indian cinema. Uh, you know, he, he, was, he was a huge scholar. Uh, you know, he knew Sanskrit. And uh, he was a, what should I say? He was a proponent of uh, Indian culture. So somewhere he started picking up themes from Indian mythology, Indian history. Right? And uh, using that as the... Uh, movie plot. His movie, the first Indian, truly Indian silent film, which you know, which only Indian hands worked at, it, was Raja Harish Chandra, 1913, a Marathi silent film made by Dada Sahib Palke. And interestingly, you know. He was director, the producer, uh, uh, writer, the cameraman, the editor, the makeup artist. And it was, uh, uh, you know, pretty uh, interesting commercial success as well. And he made this movie at the toughest of the times. That in itself is a very inspirational story. And, uh, you know, uh, the, the same goes for Satyajit Ray, another gem of Indian cinema. When he made his first movie, Pathir Panchali, that was also a struggle. And both of them produced masterpieces. Right? Uh, so this is uh, Dada Saheb Palke, another movie of Dada Saheb Palke, where he's analyzing the reels. This is how initially, in analog days, this is how the reels, you know, movie reels were made. And can you believe it? See, uh, it was a 50 minutes long movie, Raja Harish Chandra. And... The reels in length was like in 3700 feet. So they would have those, uh, you know, you get the point, I hope, those records of feel, of, of reels, heavy, which would be carried. Two of them have been destroyed. But a couple of them, the government has managed to restore them. And they are present in the National Archives. Yeah, so this is uh, Dada Sahib Palke. Achha, b b remember, I b will be talking about Indian cinema. My b b focus uh, could be Bollywood because it is, uh, you know, uh, pretty b strong an industry. But I would also be referring to the important regional cinemas as well, which they are uh, very strong in their own right. Especially Tamil and Malayali. Because they have a huge diaspora population, do you see? They have a huge diaspora. So, Tamil and Malayali has a, a huge edge there. Okay, so when you look at Tamil cinema, this is R. Nataraj Mudalia. He is called as father of Tamil cinema. He made the first uh, silent film in a South Indian language. In Tamil. Hey, uh, this is called as a Kichak Vadham. Kichak Vadham. Okay, Mudalia. Very, very big name in Tamil cinema. Uh, but when it comes to uh, Telugu cinema, this is Raghupati Venkaya Nayadu. Right, he must have been from Andhra. And he seems to be the father of Telugu cinema. He produced the earliest silent films and he was also the first person to own cinema halls in Madras. In Madras. Uh, another very interesting personality for you guys, right? right? Uh, this is uh, Fatima Begum. Fatima Begum. This is the first female director. First female director. Can you believe it? As early as 1926. This, this female 
she uh, you know came up with the bulbul eparista and one very interesting point which i think i should make here is uh, in the early phase of our uh, cinema's history in fact across the globe uh, not only just in india but movie making was seen as a, a profession of outcast socially outcast people females especially right they were not encouraged to be participating here they were not expected to be you know doing roles in movies in fact this entire raja uh, harish chandra movie which we talked about uh, all the female roles were played by males dada saab phalke was unable to convince a single woman she i mean can you believe it he even approached the prostitutes the so called completely uh, outcast uh, socially outcast people he approached them offered them money but they refused so it was it was it was uh, men who dressed up as females interesting is it and see how the perception of that profession has changed so much that now the same people are considered not only the artistic uh, uh, absolutely pinnacle but also they somehow determine our social political viewpoints tables are turned isn't it chalo uh, let's proceed this is the first indian talkie first indian talkie talking movie where there were dialogues right this is alam ara it was released in 1931 and it was a venture by ardeshir irani ardeshir irani uh, this is the film where you know what uh, a lot of songs and dance were also present so scholars also believe that you know the entire i'm sure you would agree for a lot of time indian cinema was considered equivalent to song and dance routines this is how the perception was and that began somewhere from here in fact just to tell you something taking a step back and telling you something very interesting here uh, if you look at all the folk dramas that we have be it notanki in uh, your uh, up be it uh, tamasha right uh, uh, in in maharashtra or uh, be it jatra in bangal everywhere everywhere you will notice that the drama the story the narration will be accompanied by songs and dance so when the medium became cinema it reflected the same because that is how we like to be entertained that is how we like to be entertained case in point bharat muni is natya shastra he is talking about natya drama but he also includes music dances etc okay so this is alam ara this of course is mr irani the director of the movie right uh, this is another another milestone that you should be aware about uh, remember you guys are preparing for all india services right so your preparation should reflect it your examples your knowledge should have proper regional variation a north indian should not simply be satisfied by understanding the history of north india your examples have to come from south as well and same goes for uh, people from south india right so as i was telling you this is considered the first talking south indian movie you can understand it like this it had dialogues in tamil as well as telugu okay uh, it was directed by h m reddy the movie is uh, kalidas the movie is kalidas the first talkie of south india 
first talky of a Bengali is a Jumai Shashti. <clears throat> Jumai Shashti. And the first talky in Telugu, in Telugu, proper Telugu, this was a Tamil and Telugu mix, was Bhakt Prahlad. All of them were released in 1931. The first one was Alamara. Okay, Alamara, Kalidas and uh, uh, these two. All of them, right? Uh, uh, now, a lot of the movies which started coming up, as I was telling you, song and dance, that became an integral part of uh, the entire cinema adventure. Uh, Sant Tukaram. It's, uh, of course, a Marathi movie. Who is, who is Tukaram? Tukaram was a Varkari uh, saint. In Maratha Bhakti, we will study about it, right? In Maratha Bhakti movement, we will talk about uh, Namdev, Gyaneshwar and Tukaram, right? So Tukaram, uh, this Sant Tukaram is the first Indian movie which was screened at an international film festival. There are, uh, they go, try and understand, there are three big uh, film festivals globally. Cannes in France, Venice, uh, and uh, uh, Berlin, yes, these are the three big ones, right? So, Sant Tukaram was the first one which was uh, uh, screened at a, uh, you know, uh, globally renowned uh, film festival. Of course, very big achievement. Uh, in 1937, first indigenous color film, first indigenous color film comes out. This is Kisan Kanya. Kisan Kanya. This is the first indigenous colored film. Again, do you see Ardeshir Irani? He is pretty much present everywhere, isn't it? Moving on. Uh, during this time, you know, uh, foreign, you know, uh, 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 artists, technicians, they also started uh, pouring into India, right? They also started pouring into India and uh, we find that, uh, uh, you know, uh, new themes are also kind of uh, being picked up here. Uh, for example, we hear of uh, this Australian actress, Mary Evans. <clears throat> she was responsible for the first stunt film of India, stunt-based film. Right? Earliest stunt movies she was responsible for. For example, Hunter Wally. She acquired a, a stage name known as Fearless Nadia. Right? Fearless Nadia. She became pretty popular. Uh, uh, it seems she was pretty popular. Uh, Hunter Wally. Right? Of course. Another point that you can keep in mind is uh, uh, entry of Helen. Isn't it? She also came from Burma. She was also a foreign artist. Tom Alter. <clears throat> so many big names. I'm sure uh, a couple of you would be aware, uh, aware about it. Now, another point, important point here. Uh, as I was telling you, right, in this entire period in 1930s, even 40s if you see, uh, the themes which were being picked up, they, they were coming from mythology, history, and folklore. This is where most of the themes were being picked up from. There were a few exceptions where certain artists and directors were also picking up social issues. One example which is very prominently uh, taken by scholars here is an effort by a huge name of Indian industry, cinema industry, V. Shantara. I will talk about him in, in, in two minutes. But yes, remember, in 1936 itself, V. Shantaram, he came up with a movie called as Amar Jyoti, which talked about women emancipation. It picked up social issue. It starred Durga Khote in the role of a queen. And this queen is denied her infant 
this queen is denied her rights because she is a female and she decides rather than to cow down she decides as you can probably guess from the poster she decides to become a pirate right and takes her revenge amar jyoti vishantara picked up social issues right uh, another very interesting name here you know this is 1946 chetan anand the devanand's brother chetan anand he makes this movie called as a neech nagar neech nagar right uh, it won palm d'or at cannes the first indian movie to win palm d'or at cannes this is uh, one of the biggest prize of global cinema industry chetan anand's neech nagar right it was a pioneering effort in social realism he was trying to portray the social reality rather than some mythology this is social realism realism right uh, and this movie somewhere paved the way for the entire industry of that cinema which were more close to expressing the reality which they witnessed rather than focusing on box office collections so it is this movie neech nagar which is also considered a big milestone uh this is mr k a abbas his movie i would like to mention here for you guys he made this movie called as dharti ke lal and this movie was actually based on bengal famine of 1943 the bengal famine of 1943 what is this bengal famine of 1943 uh, this was a totally man made or i should probably get more specific and call it churchill's creation during the second world war which resulted in death of uh, millions of bengalis because churchill tried to procure wheat and stock it after you know for after the war usage rather than giving it to the needy bengalis so dharti ke lal by k a abbas again a very uh, important work for us uh in 1948 just after independence uh you know our industry was growing leaps and bounds uh raj kapoor mr raj kapoor he established rk films and produced uh, his first venture ag although the movie flopped but as you i'm sure you would be aware rk films went on to become you know one of the biggest production houses of the country uh most of his uh, films most of raj kapoor films most of rk films uh, you know the films which they produce under their banner most of them uh, they they tried to portray the social divide and talk about love between different classes right or love which is seen as a taboo that kind of a thing uh this is uh, you know a uh, uh, filmmaker and actor Uh, known for his work in hindi and marathi this is mr v shantara this is mr v shantara right he came up with a lot of interesting movies which were which were somewhere also inspired by the fervor of uh, nationalism remember this is the time when india is getting independence so v shantara you know made certain movies his primary movies for which he is remembered is of course dr kortniski amar kahani dr kortniski amar kahani and another movie which i would like you to remember is probably do aankhein bara hath 
this one had a more social kind of a you know uh, a theme and this one this one was very interesting this one was very interesting actually i will talk about it uh, this is the poster of dr kotniski amar kahani do you see how they are writing a hindi wala script evolves with the generation we write it differently scripts evolve with generation uh, okay so as i was telling you what is this movie about dr kotnis ki amar kahani uh, apparently there was this fellow dwarkanath shantaram kotnis right born in 1910 during the second uh, indo japanese war right uh, i'm so sorry during the second uh, sino japanese sino is china basically so but, but what is happening here is uh, in 1937 japan invaded china without any rhyme and reason without any rhyme and reason they they just wanted more resources so they invaded and they destroyed their city of nanking it is called as a rape of nanking they killed millions of chinese for fun right it it, it was it was absolutely bizarre right uh, and the situation was very bad india in those days uh, not india i should say probably nehru and some of the other uh, indian leaders had good relations with china with certain parties in china and when this entire war broke out china sought help from india china again i'm i'm putting it in a wrong way china sought help from nehru and other leaders such as subhas chandra bos so nehru and subhas they organized a kind of a volunteer group they organized a kind of a volunteer group which was sent to china man can you believe it one of the five doctors who volunteered was this gentleman and i read about him and i was so fascinated he treated more than 800 people and uh, uh, you know operated continuously for 3 days chinese respect him like crazy he is seen as a symbol of uh, what good sino indian relations can achieve awesome man awesome journey right uh, uh, i am sad that we probably i i was not able to know about him uh, early i guess we should have we all should have isn't it brilliant fellow brilliant fellow this is the kind of humanity that we require and we should cherish it we should cherish it when we see it uh this is another of v shantaram this is another of v shantaram shantaram master flick do aankhe bara haath it was inspired by the open prison reforms they are basically the prisoners they were not kept in cages or under uh, uh, any kind of uh, surveillance rather they were trusted that they will listen to their conscience they were treated in a humane manner right very interesting very interesting this entire concept was actually given by morris friedman he was a huge associate of mahatma gandhi also but known as a swami bharatanand uh this is the guy a very interesting image i had for him for you guys right uh pyare insaan lag raha hai somebody who can do this i'm sure you would agree uh, has some goodness definitely right uh okay moving on let's also get to know a bit about uh, some of these institutions which started cropping up post independence right that is also important for us so uh, indian government it established a films division by 
the idea was to produce uh, uh, documentaries on relevant issues right it became one of the largest producers of documentaries and it would produce it in different languages for obvious reasons you know it's india right uh, sk patil commission was also established pretty much in the same time frame and they recommended that a film finance corporation a film finance corporation should be established why for what purpose the idea was to provide easy finance to people who want to make films on socially relevant issues right so they gave that idea in 1948 itself but this idea was then finally implemented much later in 1960 and FFC was established right uh, in 1951 uh, your uh, central board of film for certification was uh, uh, established the censor board basically it was established in 1951 uh, so basically what happened was uh, uh, you know censors try and understand it prior to independence prior to independence uh, there were regional censors for example Bombay will have a censor authority Get my point and uh, Calcutta will have a different uh, censor authority right later on somewhere after independence these all regional censors their powers were taken away and given to one central board called as Bombay Board of Film Censors it was a central body based in Bombay Maybe because Bombay at that point of time must have been the most thriving center of cinema, right? So, uh, in 1983, right, the rules were changed and it was renamed instead of calling it Bombay Board, it became known as Central Board of Film Certification. And this is in news. I was able to dig something out for you guys in 2021 the film certification appellate tribunal fcat uh, for example let's say i am a movie maker and i made this movie and now the censor board says that you know what you need to make so many cuts if i don't want to make that cut do I have an appealing process? Yes, you have an appealing process which, which was called as FCAT where these directors and producers can take their movie quickly make the administrators see the movie and uh, you know talk about it and appeal if they consider that the decision of the censor was arbitrary. Now this has been taken away and now the government is saying that instead, if you want to appeal, please go and appeal to the judiciary, go and appeal to the concerned high court. The filmmakers, as you can understand, they are not happy. They are saying that when we get caught up into the web of judiciary, it will take a lot of a time for us. And our movies will no longer be relevant by then. Right? Uh, but these are the four sort of, uh, you know, uh, certifications which the censor board offers, right? Uh, U means unrestricted, right? Anybody can watch it. U slash A. This is where they are saying parental guidance for children below the age of 12 years. That means if the child is below 12, the parent must be present around after that they have adult content and after that they have s s is something which is called as restricted to special class for example let's say the doctors right uh, now the point which you should probably also keep in mind is uh, some people say that they should uh, you know, amend this kind of a four-point system. 
rather than introduce more pointers here yahan par kuch pointers we should add here make more categories for example uh under parental vision parental supervision for below 14 for below 16 and then adult you get the point you get the point so yeah interesting okay moving on moving on with the uh, history part right with the history part here uh, 1950s and uh, your 60s they can be called as the golden age of indian cinema this is where two things happen right one uh, very talented artists very talented directors they come and start producing art films or parallel cinema this trend is dominated by bengalis and then there's also the trend where massive uh, you know movies with mega stars also start appearing people such as devanand raj kapoor dilip saab all of them rise here and this is why it is known as the golden era of indian cinema this is where parallel cinema you remember i was talking about neech nagar right so from there that was somewhere the seed and after that here now we will start seeing a real development a real development right uh this was primarily as i was telling you led by the bengalis and the movies were associated with social realism here there are four directors who are called as legendary quartet they redefined indian cinema these were namely mrinal sen ritwik ghatak tapan sinha and satyajit ray right and satyajit ray this is mrinal sen right beautiful personality isn't it ritwik uh, ghatak again some very phenomenal movies some very phenomenal movies to his credit uh, this is uh, tapan sinha and finally the big one uh this is uh, satyajit ray who in 1955 came up with pather panchali the this is i mean uh, satyajit ray is uh, you know a known a very well known person globally a very well known person globally right his trilogy other movies are also very good but his appu trilogy apu appu trilogy he basically made a movie where the protagonist was appu you know in a small age and then different phases of his life this is called as appu trilogy the first one of that was pather panchali pather panchali the song of the road a beautiful movie matlab uh, the sort of emotions which it shows i mean uh, massive massive movie massive movie uh, i have uh, aparajit and uh, apur san sansa released respectively in 55 56 and uh, 59 this is of course pather panchali pather panchali was based on a novel written by bibhuti bhushan bandopadhyay right so bibhuti bhushan bandopadhyay he wrote a novel called as pather panchali satyajit ray adopted it to read and made a massive uh so a lot of commercial movies with the you know uh, uh, you know uh, mega stars great directors also came in such as bimal roy raj kapoor mehboob khan gurudatt etc social themes started coming up themes associated with working classes but because this is the time when industrialization was going on the first five year plan the second five year plan 
unless you correlate it with what was happening in the society, beta, this is how the society and cinema interacts. Isn't it? Okay, so, uh, uh, you know, uh, as this was, this was where industries was going, industrialization was going on, a lot of movies with working class themes, we do notice that, we do notice that, right? The trilogy, the base, you know, the first massive trilogy of superstars came in Devanand, uh, Dilip Kumar, and Raj Kapoor. Uh, Sohrab Modi, he was the responsible, he was responsible for first Technicolor movie. First Technicolor movie, which was called as Jhansi Ki Rani in 1953. Uh, you remember I told you that uh, uh, the first color film, I've already told you that, right? This is Technicolor. The technology is uh, probably, I'm not too sure about the difference of technology here, but I'm guessing this would be a bit more digital problem. Not too sure, though. not too sure though. Uh, but this is first Technicolor film, how it is, uh, you know, no. Uh, other movies, as I was telling you, the RK banner, right? They came up with a lot of movies uh, showing love across social barriers, right? Avara, one very uh, hell of a movie. Shri Char So Beast, right? Again, this was the time. Do you see? This was the time when uh, India was also uh, having wonderful relations with uh, uh, Russia, and hence came the song. Mera juta hai Japani, ye patloon Englishani, sar pe lal topi Rusi, fir bhi dil hai Hindustani. Aaya tha ki nahi aaya tha? Isi samay aaya tha, right? So yeah, such such. Uh, Wonderful linkages, right? That's what uh, is uh, so enthralling about teaching you people, isn't it? Uh, in 1954, the government established uh, National Film Awards. The National Film Awards were established in 1954. The award for best film is called as a Swaran Kamal or Golden Lotus. The first film to win the Swaran Kamal in 1954, right? It was a Shamchi I, a Marathi movie. Okay, Shamchi I. And uh, in 1969, government instituted Dada Saheb Phalke Award which is given for lifetime achievement. It was established in 1960. National awards established in 1954. Okay, uh, till 2021, till 2021, there have been 51 winners. I think the last winner is Rajni Kant, isn't it? Yes, probably. And uh, Devi Karani was the first recipient. Right? Devi Karani was the first recipient. This is Shamchi I. Won the Swarna Kamal. First Swarna Kamal. Right? And this is Devi Karani. She won the first Dada Sahib Falke. Yeah, I was correct. 67th Dada Sahab Falke. Te. Okay, uh, this is Do Bhiga, Do Bhiga Zameen by Bimal Roy. Uh, and uh, this is Mother India in 57. This was nominated for Oscar in the best foreign film category. The first film to be nominated for Oscar from India was Mother India. Right? Filmfare Awards, they were also established in 1954. They were privately owned. They were owned by the Times Group. They were owned by the Times Group. First award, first Filmfare Award went to Bimal Roy's Dobi Ghazami. Starring, uh, uh, you know, 
Balraj Sahani. Great actor. Great actor. Uh, some other massive works which came in uh, Pyasa. This is this is Guru Dutt basic, right? This is Guru Dutt. Another uh, big names when it comes to artistic cinema as a medium. Uh, one of the grandfathers of Indian cinema. This is Guru Dutt. He made uh, Pyasa and Kagas Ke Fool, one of his uh, one of the most legendary movies. Then came in the decades of sixties and. Uh, 70s uh, now the government realized that you know the entire uh, movie industry is also becoming a major factor in economy and uh, they needed uh, you know new technology they needed uh, better trained people so considering all that in mind and ensuring global standards FTII was established film and television uh, Institute of India was established in 1960 at Pune right the 60s right the 60s saw two wars the first one of course was with china 1962 and then there the 65 war as well with pakistan right and uh, as, as you can understand right during during war time the nationalistic fervor of the population is higher and as a result we see uh, movies also adopted those themes movies also adopted those things right uh, production of mega budget movies alongside art films increased right this action plus romantic era had its own stars there were own set of stars here which emerged such as Rajesh Khanna Dharmendra right by mid 70s Mid 70s, 1975 is the time when emergency, right, when emergency was imposed on India. And this is around the time when a new phenomenon emerges in the Indian cinema of that angry young man who became the protagonist of these movies, right. So love stories by mid 70s, 1975 around emergency, the theme, the dominant theme changed to somewhere. Violent action themes around gangsters. Movies around uh, gangsters, around uh, people such as Haji, Mastan, you know, they were, they became uh, commonplace, right? Uh, Heroes were depicted with a more kind of a socialist attitude. This is precisely the time if you see the word socialism was introduced into our uh, preamble. Okay, uh, the actress is one, one very major uh, implication of this, you know, violent macho movies was that women you know they were typecasted the actresses were typecasted as uh, the always a damsel in distress right this is the angry young man right based on this is this is the movie diva inspired by haji mastan Shole, both in uh, 1975. Right. This is this is where you can see. I mean, uh, uh, a, you know, a police officer. Can you believe it? A police officer, an honest police officer. When his entire family is massacred, he is not calling in the cops for help. He is calling into goons. That tells you about the way law and order situation was uh, perceived in the larger set of people there. The movie was a huge blockbuster. Other angry young men also emerged such as Mithun and uh, Anil Kapoor. They were like, you know, and the movie themes they would typically pick up will involve people rising from gutter of poverty. And becoming rich. 
uh, another very interesting trend which emerged in 70s and 80s was that of B grade horror movies courtesy Ramsey Brothers who came up with uh, you know uh, a lot of uh, very interesting movies uh, such as Band Darwaza and Purana Mandir. Uh, I can laugh at them right now but uh, <laughs> uh, when in my childhood I saw them uh, I peed in my pants. <laughs> right? So yeah, they were they were pretty interesting movies, and they would combine erotic as well, right? Just to keep the uh, you know audience titillated. So very interesting, very interesting genre they came up with. Uh, from eighties, romantic movies, family dramas, they become the, the dominant theme somewhere. Early nineties, the phenomena of anti-hero, hero with negative shades, that emerges. Right, with Shah Rukh Khan coming in with movies like Dar and uh, Basi. With the coming of LPG in uh, 1991, liberalization, privatization, globalization in 1991, that had a huge implication. Of course, the NRI diaspora, they became a massive, massive uh, target audience now. They became a, a, a huge money minting machine. But not only that, a couple of things also happened. See, when LPG as a force enters a society, what does it want to encourage? It wants to encourage consumption of material things. So the movies which will be produced by such capital will promote a lifestyle as well. which will encourage such material consumption. So, the ideal life of uh, urban youth living a very chill life, right, not worried about the realities, he became the protagonist and she became the protagonist, the urban youth, metropolitan urban youth. And uh, they became the role models. And so this very small point zero one percent of uh, Indian population. That theme, their lifestyle was shown across India and it somewhere percolated and impacted every one of us. Massive. The results are still unfolding. We are talking, right? We are talking. This is, uh, I mean, a result of that process, if you see. Uh, okay. Uh, some female directors, which I would also like to mention here. Uh, one is Sai Paranjape. She, she continued the trend of par parallel cinema, a very powerful female director. She came up with gems such as Katha and Chashme Baddur. Right? Uh, this is uh, the first Indian 3D film. The first Indian 3D film is My Dear Kutti Chathan. My dear Kuti Chatan. It was translated into Hindi as Chota Chetan. This is considered as a India's first 3D film, right? This is Meera Nair, another very well acclaimed, in fact, globally acclaimed female director from India. Uh, although calling her Indian is like uh, uh, Kamala Harris Indian. She was never in India that right she, but, but yeah she made this movie and uh, she is a very globally recognizable face Meera Nair she also later will make uh, Kama Sutra for which she will come under a lot of heat uh, by rightist groups uh, the first Dolby technology right the first Dolby sound technology uh, was uh, the first time it was used was 1942 a love story in 1994 right I think we're just 
you know, ending the presentation in a couple of minutes here. Uh, the, the Bollywood has had huge impact, right? The entire Indian cinema has had huge impact on uh, global cinema, right? And now as we are becoming more assertive, it is only bound to increase. I'm sure you would have noticed all these big, huge stars, they come to India now. Be it WWE, be it cinema, whatever forms of entertainment is present, they do come here, all these pop singers as well. For example, Coldplay, singing his hymn for the weekend, right? Uh, so the point is, uh, uh, you know, I was telling you about this, right? Indian cinema, we love our, loved our song and dance routine, right? So that somewhere inspired the revival of genre of American musicals. American musicals, they had stopped making those musicals because they thought that nobody is in, interested into this kind of uh, shit anymore. But then when they saw all these, you know, movies getting, Indian movies getting so successful globally, they revived it and they produced this movie which is called as Moulin, Moulin Rouge. Became hugely successful, which led to creation of uh, Chicago. Another massive musical. So it revived Indian, Indian industry, revives the American, revived the American musicals. In early 2000s, 2002, I believe, 100% FDI was allowed in movies. Right? This is where all the, you know, big, uh, you know, in, uh, what should I say, studios such as 20th Century Fox, Universal Studios, they started uh, coming in and acquiring and controlling production here. Uh, in 2016, uh, the government established Sham Benegal Committee to lay down the rules and regulation for providing certification, sensor certification to movies, right? It is Sham Benegal committee actually which came up with that idea that there should be uh, UA14, UA16 as well, right? So this is one committee which you can keep in mind, may come in handy. Uh, one point which you can probably keep in uh, as food for thought is... Uh, you know, the, uh, the funding at times can be questioned. At times it can be questioned that what is the source of the funding of many of these movies. At times the governments in charge have questioned it and suggested that movies, uh, you know, uh, some, some amount of money also is funneled in the, through the underworld. Right? So that is one aspect of it which probably can be inquired into. I'm suggesting with all this as recommendations, right? Uh, then other thing is the extensive copyright violation which goes on. That is also something which as a cinema industry, we need to watch out for. Because it uh, ends up costing uh, uh, millions of dollars uh, to the filmmakers. So that is also where something which we can, uh, which there is a gap and we need to work upon and improve. Uh, one final word about South Indian cinema. When I say South Indian cinema, I am basically talking about five film industries. Which are the Tamil, Telugu, Kannada, Malayalam and Tulu. These are the five language industries we are talking about. What is Tulu? Tulu is that language which is spoken in this region, the coastal Karnataka region. It's called as Tulu. So collectively all five of these languages, the movies they produce, we call it South Indian industry. And another point that you can probably, in fact, yes, you must talk about it. If a question in mains or an essay comes in around this topic, uh, remember to mention that one very major, uh, you know, aspect which is evolving and Indian cinema needs to uh, uh, but what should I say? 
adapt to it is the OTT platform, over the top platform such as, uh, you know, uh, these guys. Especially after the pandemic, I'm sure you would agree that they have become a major stakeholders in the entire process of movie distribution. So how to ensure profitability working via this model? That is also something which needs to be carefully understood by experts. All right. With this, I'm uh, ready to end this uh, session. It was a serious pleasure engaging with you guys. God bless you all.